The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. On the first day of the week, at the first sign of dawn, the women went to the tomb with the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb, but on entering discovered that the body of the Lord Jesus was not there. As they stood there, not knowing what to think, two men in brilliant clothes suddenly appeared at their side, terrified. The women lowered their eyes, but the two men said to them, Why look among the dead for someone who is alive? He is not here. He has risen. Remember what he told you when he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man had to be handed over into the power of sinful men and crucified, and rise again on the third day. And they remembered his words. When the women returned from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the others. The women were Mary of Magdala, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. The other women with them also told the apostles, but this story of theirs seemed pure nonsense, and they did not believe them. Peter, however, went running to the tomb. He bent down, and he saw the binding clothes, but nothing else. He then went back home, amazed at what had happened. The Gospel of the Lord. Eostre, the word from which Easter is derived, was a pagan Anglo-Saxon goddess of the dawn or of the sunrise. The point of sunrise, which is in the east over there, is derived from it. Now, centuries ago, the Catholic Church invested this pagan festival with new meaning. When the sun rises in the east, it disperses the darkness of the night. But when the Son of God rises from the dead on Easter Sunday morning, he disperses the darkness of sin, of error, of death, and the Prince of Darkness himself. When adults were baptized in the early church, it was mostly adults, as you know, they came into the church and the bishop was there and all the candidates for baptism would first face the west which is over there and the west of course was the abode of darkness because the sun went down there and after they had renounced the darkness after they had renounced satan then the bishop ordered them to turn completely around in the other direction and face the east and when they faced the east, they proclaimed their faith in the risen Christ. Resurrection is the central teaching of our faith, and without it, our believing in God would be in vain, and our lives would be bereft of meaning. St. Augustine says, we are Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. Now, Alleluia, just like Amen, is of Hebrew origin. It was silent during Lent, but now comes into its own and is meant to be proclaimed with great gusto as an unparalleled acclamation of praise to the risen Christ. Now, even from an, a rational point of view, if you never entered a church, if you never read the Bible, if you never had great religious feelings, you're still not off the hook. Because 
Even from a rational point of view, the resurrection makes sense. Science tells us that nothing in nature, not even the tiniest particle, disappears without a trace. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. And I think it's more noticeable at this time of the year when nature is, itself is bursting into new life. But since we humans are the cream of God's creation, we are the high point, then it wouldn't make sense if death were to signal the end of our existence or for us to be consigned to an eternity of nothingness. We shudder at the thought. So the resurrection, even for non-believers, should really make sense that we're going to live beyond the grave and one of the aspects of the resurrection of Christ is that he has paved the way for us to enter into life eternal as well. However, eternal life must begin in the here and now if we are going to have any chance of achieving it in eternity. It's not an abstract truth. For instance, Whenever we have our love rejected and we love again, surely that's resurrection. Whenever we repent of serious sin and with God's grace turn our lives around, that's resurrection. How do we know that? Well, if you remember the story of the prodigal son, at the very end when they killed the fatted calf, they were celebrating and the father said it was only fitting. He said that to the elder brother um, who was a bit more rose. Um, and a bit jealous of the party that was thrown for the younger son who had gone away from home and, and lived a sort of a reckless life. But the father said, it's only right we celebrate because he that was dead has come back to life. Now, surely that's resurrection. And whenever we forgive or are forgiven, that's nothing short of resurrection, and we say that in the Our Father. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who sin against us. These moments, however, point to a deeper longing which God has planted in the human heart. It's a sort of an eternal seed, a yearning for that fullness of life and love, which only he can satisfy both here and in eternity. So it doesn't matter what kind of family you come from, it doesn't matter what kind of house, whether it's big or small you live in, it doesn't matter what kind of a job you have, and you might look the most contented person in the world, but there is a restlessness in all of us so that we will be looking forward to that fullness of life and love um, which we're destined for. And I think St. Augustine put it beautifully when he said, you have created us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. But like I said at the beginning, when the converts came into the church and they were preparing for baptism, they would turn towards the west. Now, there is darkness around. And we know that the war in the Ukraine is going on at the moment. That's a darkness over that land. And we have to see darkness in other places as well so that we can resist it and really if the resurrection is going to mean, any, mean anything to us, to turn towards the light. Here are a few statistics that might astonish you. Drug deaths in England and Wales are at their highest level ever, with roughly 4,500 people dying last year alone. Four and a half thousand young people. You're, you're meant to die when you're old. Not when you're young. You have your whole life ahead of you. And drugs can cut short that life. And cause misery, not just to you, but to your family as well. And another statistic from the Home Office is rather interesting. 
crimes associated with drugs cost nearly, not 20 million, 20 billion pounds a year in England alone. So crimes associated with drugs cost this country 20 billion pounds. Now you'd build a lot of hospitals for that. All wasted money in one sense. That is part and parcel, like is St. John Paul II of Happy Memory. He calls that part of the culture of death. Now, if we're really serious about our baptism, if we're really serious about Easter and about following our Lord, we really need to turn to the West and renounce that kind of life, because that's leading nowhere, only to death. And then when you turn to Christ, he's offering us everything. He's offering us life eternal. And why do we substitute that for that? I think prayer is most opportune. Maybe that's one way we can really help, but I'm sure there are many other ways. Because if we are resurrection people, that means we need to be passing on resurrection to other people and showing them the way. We are Easter people, as St. Augustine said in the fifth century, and Alleluia is our song. So let's pray. May Christ rising in glory, dispel the darkness from our minds and hearts, and from the minds and hearts of all people who long to be set free from the shackles of the culture of death and experience new life in Christ. I wish you all a very happy and holy Easter. God bless you all.